My father saved that lady's life. He was a hero. My father wasn't killed by the firearm. He was killed by the person behind the gun. I think when they see me as a monster, I don't know how they're going to feel when they see me for the first time. He has no way of knowing the anguish that I've felt for 10 years. Because I've been wanting to say something for a long time, and this is something that, that needs to be done. I will know if he's if he's really remorseful or not. If he's not, then we we got problems. I've spent half my life working with the criminal justice system, and I've seen lives devastated by violence. We like to imagine that after the verdict, the story is over. The victim and the offender are never meant to meet again. But for some, the only way to move forward is to come face to face with the person who shattered their lives. So I'm on my way to Indianapolis, Indiana. They used to call it the crossroads of America because they got so many interstates zipping through here. People are always coming, always going to a place like this. Indianapolis attracts a lot of people from around the world, including a guy named Mario Gonzalez Tello. A Peruvian immigrant came here to pursue the American dream and doing really well. And then he lost his life. In 2008, Mario was fatally shot trying to help someone in need. He was uh, trying to interrupt a robbery in progress. I'm on my way to meet with two of the sons of Mr. Gonzalez Tello. They actually want to meet the guy who killed their father. And I want to talk with them about that. I really want to know why they decided to take that kind of a step at this point 10 years later. Hey. 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 Good nice to meet, to meet you. you. Hey. Appreciate you guys making time for me. All right. Me. All right. So you guys are brothers. Yeah. Um, uh, which, who's the young one? He's I'm the youngest. The, you're the baby? I'm the youngest. You're <laughs> youngest of four. Youngest of four? Uh, He's the oldest of four. Wow, uh, OK. We were taught to be uh, strong, willed, good people, help your neighbor, always open doors type of people. Growing up as an immigrant son, I think I had the only Spanish name in Martinsville, Indiana, kind of kind of a little hillbilly town, you know. My mom was hillbilly, my dad was Peruvian, so. My mother and my father divorced when I was very young. We were lucky in that sense that even though we were from a broken family, I was still able to have a good relationship with my father, and uh, my mother was a tremendous, tremendous person. What kind of a man was your father? Yeah, I came from Peru in the early 60s. My father came to America with uh, $7 in his pocket. And he didn't even speak English. He got an education here, ended up speaking seven different languages. And he learned tool and die making. And he was still working. Mm -hmm. When he passed away, he was 72 years old. I asked him, I said, why don't you go ahead and retire, enjoy life a little bit? He goes, if I do that, I'm going to rust. I don't want to do that. Yeah. If I rust, I rust. <laughs> that's, what that's what he said. It's the only thing that's keeping me young and beautiful. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Those are his words. He was passionate about singing, and he loved opera. And every now and then, I'll wake up, I'll roll out of bed, and I'm like, oh, that little tune is in my head, that, that tune that Dad would sing to us. He ended up getting a degree in, in math and a degree in opera. If I asked him one time, I said, where'd you get all this information? He goes. I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to go, OK. He goes, to keep it concealed in books. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character. How did you even find out that you lost him? I'll never forget that Monday. I was at my house. I had uh, my son Carter with me. It was very early in the morning, and somebody's knocking on the door. And I look out the window, and I'm like, what's a police officer doing here? He just said, look, your dad was shot. And he's no longer with us. Is it harder to hear that your father was murdered? Or is it 
harder to explain to your eight-year-old son. I had to do both of those things that day. What happened the night that your father was murdered? On this particular night, he went to one of his friend's restaurants, a Mediterranean restaurant. He was eating. They were closing. They went to close the doors. He went out to his vehicle. And he saw that this kid was robbing this lady. And uh, dad being who dad was, got out of his car. My dad had a snub nose handgun. The assailant turned and, and shot dad. He was shot in an artery near his liver. Which is a death shot. I go back to that same spot every year, uh, that same little parking spot where dad had parked. Took a lot of a lot of pictures, didn't they? There's Dad's revolver. Yeah, this definitely uh, reopens a lot of wounds. My sister's had this box for ten years, and she's had it almost kind of like a little shrine to Dad. Hey, Ellie. Hey, Aldo. Sorry, I missed your call. We got done looking through the box. How'd it go? It's hard to look at that stuff, you know. I, I, I know. It. I, I, it's hard because I want to just hang on to those. Right. But I don't want to actually open them. It's like I want to just keep them the way they are. So do open up whatever you want. I just personally couldn't do it. Police chief said that night that my father was a hero because he saved that lady's life. He was a hero. He's a hero to me. You're going now to sit down and talk with Dominique, the guy who killed your father. What are you each individually hoping to understand in this situation? Yeah. I want to see that he's remorseful. I want to see him change. You know, we all have to answer for everything that we've done. And at the end of the day, we're going to one of two places, you know. There's things that Dominique knows that we don't know. What was he thinking? What, what happened? You know, what did dad say? Was he trying to initiate in a gang? There's questions I have that I want Dominique to answer that only he knows. The last time you saw Dominique was in court 10 years ago. What's that experience, to be in a courtroom with the guy who killed your father? My whole goal of sitting on that stand was to look him in the eye and ask him, who do you think you are? I think he only looked up once at me, kind of caught my eye. and kept looking down at his hands. And he never really wanted to see me as a human. He never wanted to see Mario as a human. And it bothered me. I just find it amazing how people just don't care. I believe this case should have been a death penalty, but it's not. The kid shot and killed my father. my way to Carlisle, Indiana, into the Wabash Valley Correctional Center. I'm gonna be meeting with Dominique Staten. Uh, he's the guy that shot and killed Mario Gonzalez Tello. Dominique was 16 years old uh, when he took this man's life. He got an 80-year sentence, so he's essentially gonna spend his entire adult life behind bars. The last time Dominique saw uh, Mario and Aldo was 10 years ago when they were in court. So I really want to hear why he's willing to meet with them now and talk with them. How you doing? How you doing, brother? How you doing? Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to see you. So this is your gym? You do sports yeah. and stuff in here? Yeah, we 
volleyball, basketball. Most of the time we basketball. Yeah, As, you got the right name for basketball. Don't yeah, me. Probably, yeah, my dad gave me that name. One of my dad's favorite players. Part of the thing I just wanted to just get a kind of better understanding of is just um, just your upbringing. Uh, how'd you grow up? I grew up. I grew up in Indianapolis. Indianapolis on the west side of town. The neighborhood was kind of rough. I seen a lot of crime going on, like robberies and drug selling, fights and all types of unnecessary stuff. When you were a little kid, were you that like little like feisty bad kid? Were you that little like quiet nerdy kid? Like what kind of a kid? Were you? I stayed in trouble doing something like it's been a kid throwing rocks at cars and stuff like that. No, mischief. Just mischief. I like being outside. I was adventurous. Just having fun, just being a kid. I love sports. I think that was my first real thing I loved doing. But when I got in high school, I became a letterman in some football, baseball. I played golf. I wanted scholarships. I wanted to go to college. Education is very important in our family. They they big on that. And my mom hold me to a higher standard. I had a good relationship with her. My dad was kind of tough on me because he liked me. You maintain the grades, you can play sports. But my grades were always good. I always maintained a B average. My family, they always see me in school doing normal stuff, like going to classes, going to ROTC, and doing just stuff, just having fun. But when nobody around, I'm a whole nother person. Nobody expected this. Nobody. What, what were you doing? I was just going like stealing stuff out of stores and everything, going to school, selling them. What what was the money for? I like Jordan, I'm a shoe man. I like shoes. Sneakerhead. Yeah, I was sneakerhead, man. I, I got to love them shoes so much. I'm like, man, I gotta keep up these shoes. Why didn't you just ask your mom for the money? I seen my mom go through a struggle a lot of times and it hurt me. I hate to hear my mom cry when she couldn't do what she wanted to do for her kids. But my mom made a lot of sacrifices. How she gonna pay this bill? How she gonna make sure we eat at times? So I took it upon myself, like, all right, I'm gonna help out. So I did at times we'll buy groceries put in the house. I told mom I, I brought groceries though. She said, how you get the money? I lied to her, like, I saved it. You know, I saved it. She's like, oh, you saved it? Yeah. She's like, all right, I'm proud of you. I'm like, yeah. But at the same time, I'm consistently lying to her about what I was doing. I ain't never told nobody what I was doing doing robbery cases and stuff like that, and then going to news and stuff like that, just getting away with it, ain't getting caught, or watching movies or something. But at the end of the day, this ain't movies. This is real life. Probably when I was like 15, broke in somebody's house, took some valuable stuff. And once I tried it and I didn't get caught, I just kept going with it. How did the gun get involved in your life? I brought a gun when I was 15. I felt like, I felt protected. I never told my family about the gun. I always hid the gun in my room. And at times I carry it if I know I'm about to go into an environment that I know is dangerous and I have to protect myself. So you got this gun. Um, what happened that night? I mean, how, I mean, how did that situation go down, the situation that got you here? June 30th of 2008, I was sitting at home I'm just counting the money, and I was seeing how much money I was short of getting this car I wanted. So I, look, I walked out of the house. It's dark outside, and I got this gun on me. I seen the lady coming out of the restaurant. So I run across the street, across 38th Street into a parking lot, ran up on this woman. All that I asked her was for the money. And she was telling me no. And I was like, listen, I'm not here to kill you or nothing like that. You just give me the money. And she was like, no. And so I pulled my gun out on her. As soon as she turned around and about to give me the money, I heard somebody say, hey. I turn when I turn around, I see this man over from a distance pointing a gun at me. And my mind just went in a state of shock. And 
I told my gun that he been shot. And once I shot him, he just he just dropped. I turned around and she was screaming and she gave me the money and I took off running. And after that, I just I hope he didn't die. That's the first time in my mind, I hope he didn't die. And the following morning, I seen it on the news. It's just like, my heart just dropped. I don't know, it was just, my mind wasn't there no more. A week or two later, I committed a robbery. And uh, they pulled me over. I still had that gun in the backpack. I committed a murder with. But then they, they somehow figured it out? They figured it out. They put two and two together because that gun. But then I guess they did an autopsy. Mm -hmm. We found the ballistics to that gun, wherever it matched the bullet the man was killed with. They said my fingerprints was on it still, so. I pled guilty to a felony murder and robbery. So he turned around, and there's a guy there, and he did not have a gun. Uh, what would you have done? I told him to get down on the ground. My intention was not to kill nobody. Do you think that Dominique would have shot at your dad if your dad hadn't had the gun? This story is not about the gun. The story is about somebody who was willing to get out of his car to put their life in danger to save their friend. On the news, they're saying he's a hero, he's a good Samaritan. How does that land with you? At that time, I tell you, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He put a gun out. I ain't put a gun on him. Yeah, I was scared for my own life. When you see a gun pointing at you, your first reaction is to shoot back. In that situation, it could be possibly me or him. You don't know who's going to shoot first. I know that if Dad was not carrying a gun that night, the outcome would have been the same. It's got to be redone, man. Working with my brother, uh, we do restoration, um, roof, gutter, siding, room additions. I, wonder, I don't know how they're attached. Let me bring my ladder over there. He and I have got a really good relationship now. It's uh, nothing like what it was growing up. So what are we doing? Snacking. Waiting for the food to cook. Oh, OK. Mm -mm. What you got this, there, baby? This macaroni salad you made was really good. We didn't do a lot together growing up. Him and my dad, they went against the grain amongst each other quite a few times. It bothers my brother because there's a lot of things that he wishes that he could say to my father. In 2008, before the incident with dad, he had gone through a triple bypass surgery. And I had been taking care of him. And uh, it was rough. We fought a lot. It escalated to a point where I was just done. And so I drove him home. And I never thought I'd ever speak another word to him again. That's how mad I was at my father. But there came a point, thank God it happened, we talked. And I told Dad I'm sorry. He said, I already forgave you. So I learned forgiveness from my father. The right thing to do by way of my father is to forgive Dominique. As hard as it is and as terrible of the thing that he's done, we're all monsters in our own way. Well, we're not all the, going around robbing people and not all going around true. shooting people. But don't you think forgiveness needs to be earned? No, no. How can he earn it? Forgiveness isn't something that you wake up one morning and you decide to forgive somebody for wronging you and it's done. Forgiveness is waking up every morning and choosing to forgive again. Look, my brother's different than I am. He looks at things different. We still disagree on a lot of things, but that's OK. I mean, that's what America's all about, right? We don't have to all get along. In a case like this case, do you sometimes wish there had been capital punishment? You know what? If he really could turn his life around and change somebody's way of thinking and help other people, I'm glad that he's still alive. If Amen. he's not remorseful, I think probably capital punishment would have been probably the best thing. It's hard for me to forgive somebody if they don't care.
What's the impact on your family, you being locked up? It impacted them a lot because I had a bright future ahead of me. I got arrested, everybody was devastated. It hurt me a lot to see the agony in my mom's face, my sister's face, my brother's face, my auntie, my uncles, just friends and stuff like that. My dad, he was furious. He couldn't even speak to me. He taught me a lot to try to do the honest way of living as much as possible, how to survive in this world. And it hurt, I know it hurt him a lot for what I did. I feel like I let them down. I feel like a failure to them, and it hurt me. These 10 years I've been incarcerated, my family has got me through. Hello? I call my mom once a week, every week, and I call to talk to my brother and sister. You get my message? I sent you a message, too. I love when I get pictures from cards, letters. I like looking at my pictures and stuff sometimes because it reminds me of my family. My family did a lot for me, and they did the best they could. I knew from right from wrong because that's how I was raised. But at that time, I, I, I had an attitude. You were in court when Aldo was talking. Yeah. What's that like? Aldo, he goes up and he speak. I'm sitting there like, not so long, like, man, let's get this over with. But when he spoke, he's like, why? What made you want to kill my father? And he even said, you're a coward. As he was talking, he was crying. And I just, he said, he forgive me. And I hope that you get your life together and walked off the stand. Mario, he comes up. We just staring at each other, me and him. When he finally said something, he said, I hope you can go in there and be a better person. When I finally got here, I sat in the cell by myself. I sat there and thought about my life. I cried. And I balled up and cried. What did it mean to you when you found out that they wanted to actually sit down and have a conversation with you man to man? It's been 10 years since everything that's happened. I went from being 16 to 26. I went through a lot of growth. I'm not the same person I was when I was 16, so I want to show the man I became. I mean, how do you think they're going to be feeling? To be honest with you, from what I see in that courtroom, Aldo had a forgiving heart, but Mario, his feelings was very mixed to me. How are you guys feeling right now? I'm feeling pretty anxious about it, honestly. What are you worried about, or what are you anxious about? My anxiety is with how he's going to respond to what we say to him. Yeah, Mario, how do you feel about it? I think I, uh, the pressure's on him. I'm not nervous. It takes a lot to make me nervous. I'm pretty calloused right now, so you know, I'll just take it as it goes. You know, what do you want to see come out of this? If I told you I was ready to forgive, I'd be lying. You know, I'm not going to go there and sing kumbaya and be hugging trees with him or nothing like that. That's just not me. I mean, he was my father, you know. I can't force somebody to be something I want them to be. What about you, Aldo? Why is this so important to you? I think something good can happen from this terrible event. I can't do anything about the incident. What I can do is hope and pray that Dominique can do something. Yeah, hope and change only gets you so far. It's an evil world. What else are your questions you have for him? Yeah, there's a lot of small details about the shooting itself that I wanted to know. What did dad say? Did dad pass away quickly? Personally, I don't want to know that. <laughs> I don't want to know, oh, he was there gasping for breath, and it took him five minutes to die, and he was looking up at I don't want to know any of that. I do. Absolutely do. It's the last thing that dad did on Earth. I want to know what it was. Well, I know what the last thing my dad did on Earth. He died helping somebody. Well, they were asking me, not you. Oh, I understand that. And I'm kind of getting upset, so I'm going to take a break for a second. <clears throat> what are you feeling right now? It seems oftentimes that every, people want what they want, and they're not interested in allowing what other people may need. We, we've got one shot, one chance 
to have answers. And I don't want 10 years from now to wonder, to keep wondering. He's so dismissive. I'd rather be doing this by myself instead of that bullshit. So what's been on your mind? The opportunity that I'm getting right now to meet Mario and Aldo. It's been heavy, it's been heavy in my heart because I've been wanting to say something for a long time and I felt like I've been silent for so long. I still live with that guilt in my heart. Have you given any thought to what it'll be like the first time when you walk in the room? I'm gonna be nervous. I'm not gonna lie to you. I have a little cousin that I look at as my little brother and he looked up to me a lot. He still do. I, mean, I love him. And but I try to tell him to stay on the right path because one bad choice can alter your whole life. What do you think this will mean to him? <sighs> it's gonna mean a lot to him. Hope you can see it on me, the man that I am today. I'm just nervous. I'm just I'm nervous all around the board. Everyone I've worked with has thought about backing out of this at some I point. I'm not backing out of anything. Once I commit, I'm all in for it. And this is something that, that needs to be done. Yeah. Appreciate you getting a little bit of time with you. I know you're sure. working hard, getting ready. Mm -hmm. This whole thing actually started in Indiana, this whole idea of dialogues and restorative justice and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the epicenter here in the late 70s was Elkhart, Indiana. It was Howard Zare who um, a lot of people refer to as the grandfather of restorative justice that brought some of these ideas. What is restorative justice? I, I think restorative justice uh, empowers the people who are most affected by crime to come together and heal in ways that we didn't know before. Um, it can reduce post-traumatic stress symptoms. I think it's an approach to justice that's focused on repair and accountability, not just on punishment. Don't you think that somebody who does something horrific like this, shooting somebody over money, uh, needs to be punished? It's one thing to sit in front of a judge or sit in front of a prosecutor, go to prison, get arrested. It's one thing to go through that type of accountability, the formal part. I think it's an entirely different thing to come to terms with what you've done, to take ownership of that, and to see the pain you've caused to other people. To me, this is true accountability. This mm -hmm. is facing the harm that you've caused to, to another person. This isn't facing the state of Indiana. This is facing Mario and, and Aldo. Think about it, though. How, how do you think you're going to feel when he first walks in? Because sometimes I feel like disgust, disgusted. At it all. I didn't expect, uh, I thought I'd be all right, but man, I know when I see him, I'm gonna get mad. It's not real until they sit down in that circle tomorrow. It is not an easy thing to do. This is why so many offenders I work with think about backing out of this process. They know how hard it's gonna be to face what they've actually done to the people they've actually hurt. He has no way of knowing the anguish that I've felt for 10 years. That my kids won't know my father the way I knew my father. I think Mario Aldo perceived me as a monster. I'm nervous. It's been 10 years. I don't know how they're going to feel when they see me for the first time. What I would give to hear my father sing again. Dominique has no way of knowing that. I want him to know. If someone was really sorry, they wouldn't have went the next week and did the same thing over until they got caught. That upsets me. And that's what makes me mad. I'm not the same person I was when I was 16 years old. 
I know I did was wrong, but if he didn't have that gun, nobody would have died. Nobody. Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to start by introducing who's here. This is Dominique, got Mario, Aldo, and Stephanie, Aldo's girlfriend. This meeting will focus on an incident which happened June 30th, 2008. We want to explore in what way people have been affected and hopefully work towards healing. Dominique, I must say to you that you do not have to participate in this meeting. You're free to leave at any time, as is everyone else. Does everyone understand that? Can you talk about when you heard the news? What was your reaction? I was at home with my son. Um, got a phone call telling me dad's no longer with us. And what was hard about it was that I had to tell my son it was bad enough that I'm trying to process everything, but now I got to figure out what to say to my boy. You know, I told him some bad's happened. Grandpa's, grandpa's dead. And I, I remember him getting up, coming over and hugging me, trying to take care of me. Sometimes I feel haunted by some of those moments that I shouldn't have had. Shouldn't have had it. What's been the hardest thing for you, Mario? I feel I'd probably say the hardest thing is the effect on other people. Everybody, my nieces, nephews, my sister, my other brother, his friends. You know, I lost my father, but you know, the world lost the greatest guy I knew. I mean, the one thing that really gets me through it was just, you know, my faith in God. Dominique, is there anything you'd like to say this time? Uh, I just want to tell y'all, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. It was never my intentions that night, if whatsoever, to kill your father. I was just scared because when I seen the gun pointing at me, I didn't know what to do, I just panicked in a state of shock because I don't know if he could have shot me because he didn't have to say anything. He could have just did it. He said, hey, and I was scared. And I'm, I'm deeply sorry for that. Was it that he said, he said, hey? That's what he said, did he say anything else? He just said, hey, and all I seen was a him standing with a gun pointed at me. How many shots did you fire? I shot. I shot him. I remember. I shot him once. Well, I know how many. I know how. I know how many shots he got hit with. But did you fire all of your shots? I can't remember that. No sir. When you got the firearm, how did? Where'd you get it? At? I, I brought it off somebody off the street. I didn't want plan on using it. Was there any gang? No, I was never in no part of no gang or none of that whatsoever. So gang had nothing to do with it? No, this sir. This was just you? It was just me. I knew you guys would have had questions. That's why I took this opportunity, because I would have questions. Yeah. Like, what really happened that night? You know, when something like this happens to a person, 
And I mean, it just calluses you. I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm on a roller coaster. Some days I'm mad, some days I'm sad. I mean, a lot of times my emotions are up and down. It's important that you're a different man than you were 10 years ago. It's important to me. Otherwise, dad is gone and you're gone and my family is left broken. I really hope you understand what you did was wrong. When the murder had happened, it was just a blur to me. Everything was a blur. I wasn't on the right mindset. And what y'all said to me in that courtroom the day I got sentenced, it stuck with me tough. Cause when you got on the stand and you said you was a coward, you did a cowardly act. You was a coward for killing my father. You said, I forgive you for that. I took that with me. When Mario, you got on the stand, and when you had told me, I hope you'll go in there and change and be a better person and help someone, and that stuck with me. When I got here, I wrote y'all words down on a piece of paper and kept it with me. And to this day, I still have that piece of paper. I mean, I kept that the whole 10 years since I've been here every year. I don't miss a beat. I look at it and read it and apply it to me, doing what you ask of me. So what, what are you doing now? I'm working. I just recently completed my apprenticeship. My apprenticeship in what? Electrical Mechanical Engineer Assembler. It was a good trade to have for me going to the outside world. Tell me about some of the things that you, some of the certificates you got, some of the programs. Well, you I got. have a, I completed my GED when I got here. I did a PLUS program. It's a, basically a character faith-based program of life skills, but it taught me a lot, and that program helped me grow as a person, find character traits about me that I didn't really know about. I took my freedom for granted, and it bothers me each and every day that I'm in here, but it made me a better person along the way. I still have problems. We all got problems, but my problems I learned how to work with them. I've been learning more being held accountable for all my actions. What we want is for dad's memory not to just fade away. I want you to have hope. You're with people who are in dark spots. You can be the light for them. And now dad's memory lives through you. It's not just over when he died on that parking lot. Every year on June 30th, I take that moment at that time and pray for your family. Because like, their kids lost their grandfather, they lost, some people lost a friend, a mentor, a brother, whoever he may be to those. I'm very remorseful and I'm deeply sorry about this whole situation because it was never my intentions to kill anybody. I was just being selfish and greedy. I wanted something that I should have worked hard for when I had a chance to. I could sit here and hate you all day long, okay? One, it takes way too much energy. I don't want to invest that much energy into hate. We got enough hate in the world right now, man. I mean, we, we, need, we need to stop. We hate what happened. I don't want you to think we hate you. And I'm proud of what you're starting to do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you're taking the opportunity to be a better person. I feel in my heart that you are remorseful. And we all make mistakes. Hope heals everything. You get to write the last chapter for my dad. Dominique, is there anything you'd like to say this time? Um, 
I mean, this is a blessing. This, this guy's work. And I'm so, so deeply sorry for what happened to Mr. Gonzalez. I know I can't bring him back or anything if whatsoever, but I can hold this memory to my heart for the rest of my life. Thank you all for your contributions. Dominic. Is it good? Cool. Shake your hand. Thank you, all, Dominic. We appreciate it. Thank you, man. We appreciate it so much for this opportunity. Thank you, son. We appreciate you, man. Hey, just remember, God loves you, man. Yes, he does, OK? Yes, sir. All right. There's no way to prepare for something like this. You got two brothers with different perspectives. You've got Dominique super nervous on the front end. Dominique sat down. There was an X-ray into his soul. And he was composed. He was remorseful. And I think that gave tremendous uh, relief to both brothers. I feel a lot better. I do. It strengthens me to know that there is good. I'm glad this happened. So you want to sing Kumbaya? Or I know. <laughs> <laughs> you could, if I can remember the words. <laughs> Dominique is going to have something else to write down on that piece of paper that he keeps in his room, which is hope heals everything. And if he can stick with that, he's going to keep moving forward.